Yeah, we were looking at UFI, we were looking for ways to uh, engage with everybody in these particularly difficult trying circumstances. And uh, we've been doing team meetings on Zoom and this seemed like the best way to get started. So uh, the goal today is really very simple. Uh, we wanted to take an hour to let everybody get together to get some of our members from around the region. Uh, to provide an update on what's going on uh, in their particular markets or the markets where, uh, where they operate. Obviously, things are changing fast. And um, I mean, even this week we had uh, the Canton Fair was canceled. So a bit of bad news and good news. Uh, one of our members um, in Shenyang, the uh, Expo, uh, Shenyang New World Expo, got approval to open at the end of April. They're gonna host their first event. So we're gonna dig into all of that in a little bit. Uh, so first we got, we have a couple slides. Jess, are you gonna share those slides? All right, hang on. Okay, so I'll just run you through the, the very quick agenda. I'll do the introduction as I'm doing now. Uh, and then we have Michael Krupper from SNEAC uh, and in Shanghai, and he's gonna update us on the latest in China and in Shanghai at his venue. We have Michael Duck from Informa Markets, and of course they operate around the region, so Michael uh, can speak to a number of different markets. Aloysius in, um, Singapore is going to update us there and hopefully a little bit on Southeast Asia as well. And then we have our incoming UFI president, Anbu, who is in Bangalore, and he'll update us on the situation in, in, in India. Uh, we'll do some Q&A at the end. If you want to ask a question, I encourage you to put it in the chat on the side. So for those, those of you who just joined, if you uh, move your cursor to the bottom, You'll see a number of different options. Click on the chat. You can send a question to all and uh, we'll try and get to it. Obviously with you know 250 plus people on the call, we won't get to all the questions, but we are gonna save them afterwards and we'll uh, try and do a summary on the UFI blog. Okay, so housekeeping rules then, uh, the one that I hope everyone can remember is microphones on mute other than uh, the speaker and you only unmute it when you're called upon. I mentioned the chat function already and then also you can post uh, about this meeting afterwards on social media and the hashtag is there. So uh, I think those are the key points and now we can really move on to the first speaker which is uh, Michael Krupper from uh, Sneak in Shanghai. And Michael, are you there? Can you take yourself off mute? Okay, I'm here. Hi, Mark. Hi, Can you hear stuff? me? All right. All right. Yeah, thanks, Mark, uh, for the introduction. First of all, great honor to mm -hmm. have that for me, one of the first big video meetings on Zoom. Uh, we even have people from around the world. I saw Mike from Washington, Alexis from Mexico, I think. Uh, so that means all over the world, people are joining us and that's a great idea for all of us all over the world to face that situation. Well, I think the idea of this call is not to complain and ask how and why we have that. It is what it is. So I like to brief you, especially on China, on Shanghai, especially on SNEAG. As most of you know, we are one of the busiest venue in the world and of course, the impact of the virus have affected us greatly. What has happened? Basically, by the end of January, when it was obvious and clear that there is a health issue, or that there is an issue with a virus, with an unknown virus, the government in Shanghai here, and later the rest of China followed, issued a note. You may call it a first major, sorry, a first major certificate meaning that all public venues, in that specific case, Shanghai, had to be closed. Later on, that was rolled out all over China, as we know. So when that happened, 
honestly, it was the first time a kind of panic here in Shanghai, especially during shortly before the Chinese New Year. Who has been to China, working with China, knows what Chinese New Year means. It means traveling people inside China domestically. Let me just guess, six, seven hundred million, maybe that figure is even too low, internally, domestically. And Chinese traveling outside China, the figures might be as high as 50, 60 million. So when that struck us, some of us were actually traveling to the Vatican. We had the honor of meeting the Pope personally. So when all that happened, we were in Europe that time in Italy. And later on, I was traveling through Germany. I remember just three weeks ago, four weeks ago, in Germany, in Europe, most people did not really understand what's going on in China. So that is the situation three or four weeks ago. And as we all know, it dramatically changed to the rest of the world. And maybe later there are questions from the audience, but what we see here right now, especially in Shanghai, I can, I don't want to say proudly, but I can honestly tell you that we are almost back to normal concerning the daily life. What does it mean? Hooray, we have traffic jams again. People are going to the subways, people are going to restaurants, offices are back to almost normal. I would just estimate that at least 80 to 90% of office staff came back to the offices here in Shanghai, Greater Shanghai. What has happened in terms of trying to protect the virus? Now, the government has issued a couple of activities. I'd just like to name a few. One of these systems is a kind of traffic light system where people domestically, but also international travelers, when they arrive in an airport, in this case, Shanghai, they have to fill out a lot of documents, papers, or even use their telephones to digitally fill out a form. And then based on the answers, based on areas they were, they have been, this system give you green to go, yellow stand by, and red basically refused. However, refused does not mean you're not allowed to enter China but you are subject to a special procedure of being tested on Corona and on where you have been in the last couple of days. Now, this dramatically changed as of actually right now, as of midnight, most, if not all foreigners will not be allowed anymore to enter China, even if you are on a valid visa. Luckily, I brought my daughter who was traveling in Germany last week back just three days ago, but the procedures, and again, she was kind of lucky, only needed six hours from landing into a quarantine hotel. So she's not allowed to stay with the family. People I knew two days later arrived, they needed, and listen carefully, 50 hours, five zero hours to go from landing to all the procedures back to their home or to a hotel. And I think that is maybe one of the reasons the government decided we cannot handle this anymore in terms of safety and protect people and to avoid these very long waiting time and queues. I think, and that's my personal view, for the moment, as we know, as, to, as of tomorrow, these international travelers will be not allowed to enter. So that is basically roughly picture because I only have 10 minutes. Now let me come to our industry, to the exhibition. What happened here in SNEAG? We have a 300,000 square meter venue, as some of you know, and many have been here probably, there's zero, and I repeat, zero business. From February, March, we have March now, April, shows are officially delayed or postponed, and we were hoping that as of May, things may look better. Unfortunately, I don't have really good news. Most of the May shows have decided to delay or postpone, some of them totally will be canceled. Mark, you have mentioned Diane just before, Diane Chen, the GM from Shenyang, and maybe there's light at the end of the tunnel a little bit. Diane, who's probably here also in the audience, we know that actually a Shanghai organizer who's also a customer in SNEAG got the approval and also Diane's venue got the approval in Shenyang, which is in the Northeast, of China and can be considered as a tier two 
city, although I think there are 10 or 11 million people, the government, the local government allowed that venue to open and to have that show take place, to have that exhibition, let's repeat the word exhibition, in that venue. Now, I believe that's first of all good news because the government decided that in a, let's say, lower level area or not so many foreigners visited area, they want to give it a try and see how an exhibition is going. Unfortunately, in Shanghai with a tier one, with give and take 25 million and maybe greater Shanghai, 40, 50 million, I believe authorities, government, health bureau, public security, police are more careful because imagine this scenario, somebody is giving too early green light to a big show which we have here in Sneak with 200,000 people, 300,000 square meters for five days. And if just one case would get a new infection, that might put all of us back to square one or even square zero. So I truly can, or maybe even not, but I can just imagine the pressure on government or whoever has to make decisions, not only for us here in SNEAG, actually for our global industry to give green light to let an exhibition in this part of the world to take place. So from our side here in Shanghai, and I believe in other cities in China, in Asia, and the rest of the world, we do a lot of work, almost daily work in connection with the local government, explaining them how in our case for our venue, but also other venues are getting ready, getting prepared. In our case, of course, in SNEAG, we follow government ideas, government instruction on protecting the visitors. Well, at this moment, I must say the potential visitors, because when I walk through my 20 halls, they are all empty. So we are right now doing a kind of dry trial. We have opened a couple of doors at the moment too, and we have daily traffic. We have like workers, we have uh, our staff, of course, coming in our security. Even an empty venue must be protected. So we strictly follow protocol on fever checks, on filling out the names, the IDs, the uh, passport numbers, the phone numbers. That's one time. Then the second time is that people here, I mentioned this traffic light system, people in China have a kind of QR code on their mobile phone. So when people enter our venue, and I think it's the same in other venues, you not only have to register and get your fever check, you also have to show that your phone is on a green status. So your QR code must be green. So for example, if you have been traveling to well, previously Hubei area or maybe outside China, and you're coming back, the GPS system automatically would detect that you have been outside a safe area. So I don't want to discuss here the face recognition issue, whether it's uh, data protection or not, but in the a, in a effort to contain a virus and to not only educate people, but to remind people that safety and distance is one of the most important parts this kind of system is working very well at this moment. Mark, I passed 10 minutes. I think that's basically most of the things I wanted to say. So thank you for letting me join. And that's all from my side. Um, okay, Michael, just stay there and leave your mic How on. How do I hear them? <laughs> <laughs> um, I j just leave your mic on uh, for a moment, Michael. And I I'll call on a couple people. I know... Uh, Bala, you're on the call, right? And you had a question you told me in advance for Michael. Bala, are you there? Give him a chance to find the uh, mute, button. Mute, mute button. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, Trevor Foley uh, also sent me a question in advance and said he wanted to ask you something. Trevor, are you on the call? I'm in, Michael. Mark, I'm in. Oh, let's go to Bala first. Okay, Bala, take it away. Oh, uh, thanks, Michael. Um, there was a good encouragement uh, coming up from China and uh, look, things looking positive and I hope things come to be um, back to normal very soon in China. And uh, wishing you all the best and take care. Thank you. My question to you uh, is on, since you're managing the venue, uh, when the shows comes back to normal or when the postponed shows come back to SNEAC, 
how do you feel uh, would be in uh, would it in size the postponed shows will it be same size will it shrink or would it grow because i'm sure many people who have lost the opportunity of business would like to use the effort of uh, you know opportunity of doing an exhibition it has an opportunity of growing so size downsize or big size yeah. Thanks, Thanks, Bala. Very okay, if you can go back to mute. Okay, sorry, Michael, go ahead. Yeah. Thanks, Bala. Very good question. We are already discussing with most of the larger organizers who have international audience to discuss and to analyze, does it make sense for them if they have 100% square meters booked, 70% of this is domestic and 30% international, for example. Does it make sense for such show to continue with just 70% because we all know that 30% at this moment is impossible to travel to China. We are right now discussing so far we have no positive reply from such organizers but the venue together with the organizers we are heavily analyzing and discussing this possibility that would mean that if some of the organizers would follow that idea that we would have shows but at a smaller or with smaller square meters. Thanks, Michael. Uh, I'll try Trevor one more time if he's there. Trevor Foley, are you there? I'm here, Mark. Great, um, fire away. Well, I, I, I think my question has probably been answered from the, uh, you know, the conversations had, because it's just about you know, hearing rumors of, uh, and Michael's just mentioned it, about a show being able to take place. Uh, you know, is that, uh, you know, is that government instruction um, you're, or was it wishful thinking? But it sounds like things are um, starting to open up, which is uh, good to hear. Um, yeah, okay. So yeah. If you don't have another question, I'll just build on that and I'll ask uh, Diane Chen, I think, uh, from Shen Yang. I think she's on the call. Are you there, Diane? That's yes. Just, oh, this is terrible lights, but okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, hey. Yeah, maybe yeah, maybe hi, Diane. Maybe just take one minute before I move on to Michael Duck, and then we'll come back to China at the end of the call as well. But uh, yeah, if you could just update us on what's happened in uh, Shenyang. Okay. Um, just uh, last week, actually this week, on twenty second and twenty third, we respectively uh, we received the notice from the Liaoning Provisional Government and also Shenyang City Governments that they informed that uh, uh, we the, the ban. So the public venue will be limited to host the larger events. So we are very excited. And um, uh, last Tuesday, uh, last Tuesday we also received a notice from the Shenyang City uh, Bureau of the Commerce. Uh, actually, the title is very encouraging too. This is a, this is a notice about uh, um, in accelerate recovery of the exhibition industry. So they are encouraged the exhibition will be hosted as soon as possible. So after we received those notices and uh, uh, the show organizer, uh, we, we had a LED um, technology equipment advertisement show. Um, as Michael mentioned previously, this show is from a Wufi member in Shanghai, Shanghai Modern Exhibition Company. And they request us to host the show one week early that means uh, they will have a uh, license period between 25 to 29 April. So, so far we were scheduled to host this show, open the venue for the public. So that, that's, that's, what yep. has, uh, that's what we have been expressing, uh, experiencing in, in Shenyang. And then yeah. uh, I have to mention that Shenyang uh, did have uh, very uh, few uh, cases compared with other uh, states, uh, you know, uh, provinces. We only right. have 28 uh, infected cases uh, in Shenyang, in together 128 cases in Liaoning province. So we haven't had any new cases, uh, I mean internal cases, uh, for at least 28 days. And then uh, the, in the new cases, in, um, most the imported case, you know, so and then they currently themselves uh, in some hotel, in some area. So most of uh, the, the places are quite safe, supposedly. <laughs> Great, Th thanks, Dad. Well, I just I just muted myself. Um, okay, so uh, Diane, if you can go back on mute, I think we'll move along to uh, Michael Duck. Michael, are you there? Yes, I'm here, Mark. Uh, can you see me? All right. Uh, yep. 
you're good. Okay. Nice. Okay. Fire Very away. Good. Okay. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. And good night to everybody <laughs> um, around the world. My goodness. It's uh, great to be able to speak to everybody. Uh, I wish I could see you all. As, as Michael said just now, uh, we were in Rome uh, just a few weeks ago, really, six, seven weeks ago. Uh, um, it feels like a lifetime has gone past since then. Uh, so it's a, a, a lot has changed. A lot's gone on. And as you can see, Mark is in, in, uh, in Hong Kong as well. So uh, uh, this has been sort of a, an, an epicenter of information for, for the region. Um, I, was, I had the unfortunate uh, uh, position to be in Hong Kong during SARS. And I had hoped that we would never, ever see that again. The fatality rates were very, very high then. Um, and people's uh, anxiety was extraordinary. It was very bad indeed. Uh, fortunately, um, I mean, say apart from us, there was, there was Singapore and also Canada that had cases at the time, but it was not as virulent as this particular coronavirus is. And certainly it's taken everybody by surprise. It's taken everybody uh, in terms of the uh, anxiety in, in the market and, and how people react to it. Uh, in a very different way, which has also affected all of our markets. And uh, we've seen huge changes in stock markets, as well as in the price of oil, for instance, and let alone seeing thousands of aircraft sitting around air airports, uh, not going anywhere, a very sad case. But I'm an optimist, and we all hope that this is a, uh, a virus and a pandemic will go away sometime soon. As we are in, as uh, exhibition organizers, we have to look to the future. We're usually in a position where we can feel what's going to happen in many different industries. And so that's why we're seeing so many um, uh, postponements of shows to the last six months of the year. In some cases, unfortunately, we've had to go into 2021 because there's just simply no more space. Let's hope that that is true. Let's hope that is the case. Um, if we take Hong Kong as an example, uh, uh, as I'm sitting in Hong Kong at the moment, um, our first show is going to be at the end of June. There's a jewelry show in the Hong Kong Convention Exhibition Center. Uh, we do hope, obviously, that by uh, the month beforehand, that the airports will open, that travel advisories will come down. Um, but certainly, the industry really wants a show. Uh, industries and businesses um, are really on the floor at the moment. The key is, and everybody's country, is that uh, there's a lack of cash. There's no cash going through the system. There's no lifeblood of a business going through the system. It's all being trapped, which is why the, uh, the governments around the place are trying to put cash back into a system, perhaps not fast enough, um, to save many particularly service industries, we see restaurants, bars, um, and, uh, many uh, tourist hotels and uh, airlines, of course, that have no blood going through their system. So therefore, they're laying off people. And this is a very dangerous precedent, not just for us in Asia, but also in the rest of the world at the moment. So it's good to see some sparks of optimism, as Michael's just said, in, uh, in, in Shanghai and also in Shenyang. Um, we hear also about new shows in, in Qingdao, Chengdu, and, and, and Guangzhou. Uh, in Japan at the moment, um, actually, although the, the shows have been in the main part put into next year, with the uh, opening of the uh, space now, because there's no longer the Olympics in 2020, what does that mean for the industry? It's very difficult to get shows back very quickly. And of course, at the moment, nobody can fly anywhere. Um, but so Japan is affected again into next year. Uh, there are some smaller exhibitions in places like Osaka, uh, which are going to take place in the next few months. But actually, generally, life in, uh, in, in Japan is, is, is quite a lot back to normal. People are in, in the offices. In Hong Kong, it's uh, about 50% of the offices um, are open. Uh, my office has been open for the past few weeks. We've got full complement of people here. 
Um, but I know that 50% of offices, people are working from home. It depends on the company. Uh, all of our offices in Shanghai are, are open and they have been for a, a little while. But in Beijing, one of the offices is open and the other one is closed. So it's, it's a little bit here and there. Um, in terms of, of what a government's doing, uh, Hong Kong is uh, it, being very fast this year. Uh, they've given $10,000 to all small, small and medium enterprises. That's Hong Kong dollars. So about 1400 uh, or 1300 uh, US dollars to every small and medium enterprise to put towards an exhibition, uh, which is very good indeed. Um, also, there are the, to help organizers, that the, there are subsidies for organizers in terms of venue uh, costs. And uh, that will be for a period of a year to help stimulate the business. Um, the Hong Kong Tourism Board, the TDC, Invest Hong Kong have a lot of cash to spend. And uh, we are talking at the moment with all of them in terms of the relaunch of the business. Uh, and that's what we need to do, not only here, but also in the region. I'm sure that Thailand, TSEB, uh, also in Singapore and Malaysia, uh, are working extremely hard there. We know in China that there's going to be big positions from Beijing in terms of putting cash into the businesses. No details as yet, um, but uh, certainly it's going to, to need it. Um, and we need to see that uh, normality come back to, uh, to the region. Uh, we all want it. We all hope to see it. Uh, you know, our business is face-to-face, -face, um, but this must be the 50th Zoom or or Teamworks uh, meeting I've had in the past two weeks. Um, it's nice to see everybody like this, but I much prefer to have a drink with you and, uh, and shake your hand. Uh, how's my time doing? It's okay there. Um, the last fair that we have had in, uh, in Hong Kong, uh, in the exhibition center in, uh, in, in Hong Kong was uh, in December and in AWE was in November. So it's quite some time. So this is putting also a lot of uh, uh, pressure on employers, particularly the, the venues themselves. They have quite a lot of employees um, in terms of what, what do they do? How do you keep them going? Uh, we as organizers, as with many other organizers, um, are uh, looking in terms of how we change some of our business uh, in terms of what we can offer our our uh, exhibitors and, and, and buyers. So we look very much at online positions, how we can make that work much better with our face-to-face -face shows. Um, we're also very concerned about uh, the cash flows going or not going through to stand contractors and freight forwarders in the region. It's, uh, it's, it's a common position. Um, and um, uh, it's, we feel for them greatly and uh, this is another reason why we need to see government or support government efforts in terms of uh, um, money going through into those sort of businesses. And I'm very pleased to see that in the UK that there have been some uh, uh, very good initiatives coming from the, um, uh, from the Chancellor uh, in the past few days. Um, Mark, is there anything else you want me to cover now or can go on to... Uh, um, uh, questions. Uh, let's just go to questions. I, I, I want to ask a couple myself, if that's all right. Uh, so you mentioned about Japan getting back towards normal, and Japan has one of the more domestic exhibition industries. So for some of them, like Hong Kong, where it's so international, I think it's going to be more challenging to get back to business. So do you see events coming back more quickly in a domestically focused market like Japan or Korea? Well, as I said, in some of the, the, the second tier cities like Osaka, Nagoya, Kyoto, maybe, um, because these are about to go on in the next four or five months. Uh, Tokyo is a, um, uh, has got a question mark on it, as I said, because there is no Olympics. But big site has been built into um, so it was all being set up for the, it was all set up for the media, uh, for, uh, for the Olympics. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how quick the organizers are able to, to bring back uh, some of the meetings there. And there may well be some support and subsidies from the Japanese government there. Uh, so that's quite exciting to see something that, that may well be able to, but it needs some, um, 
how can I say, some initiative and it needs a, a bit of uh, uh, optimism in how to make those, those work. But apparently, and, and to all my staff there, or all, all our staff there who are, are uh, in their offices and are on the street, you know, things are quieter, obviously, than, us than usual, but uh, um, things are more, uh, are more uh, normal than, than many other countries in the region. And one of the other things I've been thinking about is that maybe there'll be a network of uh, safe markets in Asia that might be able to get started even while maybe the virus is still active in Europe and the US. Many of our shows, especially Hong Kong, Singapore, Bangkok, they rely on European and American participation. But the, could you see a scenario where Hong Kong goes ahead with a show where visitors are allowed to come in from, say, Singapore, Thailand, China, Japan, where the virus has been cleared? Or do you think that's a pipe dream? Well, no, I don't think it's a pipe dream. Certainly, it's, it should be looked at. I think we're all going to have to look at uh, different uh, ways of putting on our shows. And I think that governments are going to be looking at various uh, systems of hygiene and temperature controls uh, throughout, uh, not just the airports, but also the venues. Um, we, we know in, in, in many venues in, uh, uh, in India and also China, there are security x-ray uh, systems that you go through. Um, you know, these may not be necessary anymore. The problem is not terrorism. The problem is a virus. Um, right. And the problem is going to be in terms of what's the temperature of the people coming in? Uh, and how do we look at that? Uh, how do we not have uh, queues at registrations for the future? So what sort of uh, systems do we need in our businesses to ensure that exhibitors can come with, for instance, uh, a registration on a WeChat uh, on your phone so that you can scan it as you go through? You do not want to have lots of people queuing. You do not want lots of people coming together very closely because of inefficient systems. Um, I don't know. It'd be interesting to hear from Michael. And are there discussions in terms of how many numbers of people in a hall? You know, sometimes in SNEAC um, or, and in other places, we have wonderfully successful exhibitions, uh, but uh, they are very, very crowded indeed. Uh, what's going to happen in the future with those sort of le uh, rules and legislation? Maybe even in Europe and the United States that will also come through. But yes, I think that the, there may be from one or two origins to start with, uh, certainly in Hong Kong at the moment, nobody's allowed in uh, the airport uh, unless you're a permanent resident, and that's it. Um, right. And those permanent residents have to wear a bracelet on their hand, on, on, their, on their wrist, uh, which tells uh, the government where they are. And not only where they are uh, in terms of their apartment or the hotel room, but when and if they come out over the 14-day period. Okay, and uh, two more questions from me, Michael, and then we'll move on to... Um... Uh, Aloysius, you still there? I'm here. Okay, oh, okay, you froze for a second there. Um, oh, I'm here. Yeah, great. So you mentioned uh, the support from the Hong Kong government. They've given uh, cash to SME exhibitors to uh, restart the industry when things get going. They're, they've also made an offer. Once the virus threat is cleared, uh, organizers that put major events into Asia World Expo or HKCEC uh, will have venue free rental and that that offer is meant to continue for 12 months after the outbreak uh, continues. Have, ha have you heard anything about other governments in Asia thinking about uh, similar direct support for the industry? Uh, no, I haven't seen any as yet. I know that some of them are discussing them, but they're looking at what is going on. So which is why I say for the first time, I think for many years, Hong Kong has actually taken the initiative and uh, said, this is what we're going to do. And that's certainly a, a very good initiative. Um, there are one or two things that need to be uh, ironed out in terms of those terms, as there always are. And uh, yeah. actually, I was talking with uh, the uh, Commerce Secretary yesterday about them. And so hopefully they will be changed. Great, thanks. I'll ask one more question, kind of an unpleasant one, but I think it's one we have to face. If we imagine that uh, we get back to business in September or October, which I think is, is uh, a possible outcome. H how do you think the landscape 
of our industry will have changed in Asia. I mean, you were talking about how the uh, uh, the contractors, the service providers are hurting so badly, especially the ones facing China where there hasn't been an event since early January. Um, so not only service providers, but also SME organizers. What do you think is going to be the outcome for the landscape of uh, organizers in Asia? Um, I think that some of the organizers, if it's going to take that long, will struggle to carry on. Um, so there may well be some amalgamations. Uh, as far as uh, freight forwarders and, and stand contractors, uh, there are tens of thousands of subcontractors now. Um, and it's been quite difficult for the majors who have uh, asset and infrastructure uh, for them to keep paying for uh, staff that they have and also for um, uh, warehousing that, and design studios, etc. Whereas many of the smaller um, uh, stand contractors are, are a bit more nimble there. So I think you'll, you'll start to see some of the landscape there changing. Um, and uh, the, the fittest will survive in the end. All right. Thanks, Michael. Uh, we'll have more time at the end for everyone to ask questions, but l let's uh, push on. So, Michael, if you could go back on mute and, uh, and then I'll call on Aloysius. Are you there? Yes. Uh, hi, Mark, and hi to everyone. Um, great. Great. All right. To take, take it away. Uh, okay, I'll take it away. Uh, great to see all of you. Um, we are indeed in unprecedented times. Goes without saying. Um, and certainly, as we've seen in one of the recent magazines, Earth is closed. Uh, I think for the first time, we are seeing travel coming to a halt. And um, with the start of uh, COVID-19, um, what we have seen here in Singapore, and I'm sure in, uh, in Southeast Asia and in, in China, has been uh, earlier ex, uh, sort of uh, spelt out by uh, both Michaels. Um, we've seen it as a public health uh, emergency and that led to precautionary measures being put in place and over the course of the weeks and months it the economic emergency came out and we are now at a situation where there are twin emergencies we are dealing with one is the public health and the other one is the economic fallout uh, Europe and, and US are now going through uh, both at the same time and I think it remains to be seen as anybody's question. It is actually a trillion dollar question as to when this will end. There are projections which say that uh, optimistically it could be by September, October. Some are pretty um, reasonable by looking at November, December and some are even looking at a near doomsday scenario where there will be a return to some form of normalcy in the first queue of 2021. And uh, why this is the case is because what we are dealing with now here in Singapore uh, is actually the rise of imported cases. I think we are seeing that in China. And because of what's going through in Europe and in, uh, in the US, um, we in Singapore, we are waiting for the return of 200,000 students and overseas uh, employees. And all of them, I think the authorities here are bracing themselves because they will be infected. Uh, so what has happened over the past week, there was a successive um, waves of restrictions being put in place uh, in an attempt to curb imported cases. Um, and Thus far, every day when we hear of the cases, at least 80% of them are imported cases. Um, so stay at home notices, um, uh, letter, leave of absence, quarantine has all been in place and has been very religiously practiced and being observed by the authorities. Um, just yesterday or this morning, uh, our bars, our nightclubs, entertainment, cinemas have all been closed. Um, but work still continues. We've, we've also got uh, social distancing being put in place. Any event that uh, is being undertaken, the limit is 10 persons and with a social distancing of at least one meter um, for all venues, uh, including um, 
restaurants as well as um, shopping centers, they have to put in um, contact tracing as well as um, thermal scanners and, and the like. So that's that I think is going to be a new norm. Um, it remains to be seen, it's anybody's guess, um, when the vaccine will come out. But I think um, because of the nature of this virus, unlike SARS, um, this is formed because of droplets and where it lands, if it's on a metal, it's going to be there for about 10 to 12 hours. If it's in a weather that's between 24 to 25, 6 degrees and above, it's going to be there just for a couple of hours and then it's gone. So you're dealing with a different kind of virus than like SARS. In fact, for those who have lived through SARS, three months um, right into the crisis at that time, we could see the light at the end of the tunnel. We are now three months after COVID-19 and we still do not know what the situation is. So I think it's, it would be um, perhaps wise enough for us to always make sure we have the plan B in store. I don't think so we can uh, jump for joy to say that when cases have gone down, there are zero cases, uh, we cannot be complacent. I think com that is going to be a very major risk because we do not know how this virus will act up, how it would morph. And that's been a very constant reminder from the government authorities over here in Singapore, but the health experts do not be complacent. So therefore, it's important to ensure that we've got not just the precautionary measures in place and and all centers in the world are doing that. But it's also to ensure that we've got the enhanced measures in place, whether it's contact tracing, uh, social distancing, um, and also to have a plan B, particularly for our shows. So n certainly with all these things in place, the shows have been canceled. No, no difference from Singapore or in, in Southeast Asia. Um, many of them are being postponed. Um, the first wave, if I can put it, which was in January and early February, most of the postponements were to uh, July or June, July, August. Um, and since um, WHO declared the pandemic, and then there were cases and new epicenters in Europe as well as in US, um, most shows and were again postponed to later part of the year, October, and we are now seeing even plans for shows being put in the first quarter of 2021 onwards. Um, I think that's something that we, as I said, we have to be prepared for, particularly on Plan B. Um, and I think um, the whole notion about the new normal, um, I think we've heard that time and again. Um, even if we are to get out of the woods, um, there must be this new new normal of precautionary measures until such a time when the vaccine has been developed. Um, so it's the same thing as what has happened, I guess, in SARS. There were still precautionary measures. And if I recall, after SARS were, uh, was sort of taken down from the, the pandemic or crisis level, uh, it was close to about seven to eight months before the entire crisis uh, uh, was kept in abeyance. So I think that's something we, we also have to be plan we have to plan for. Um, and therefore, recovery would certainly be, I would say, a very broad U-shaped curve. And, um, and one of the key things, because our shows depend on where, our supply, where the buyers and suppliers come from, it's all over the world. It also depends on local jurisdictions and advisories by governments, as well as travel restrictions. And at the same time, corporate travel restrictions. What we have seen when we when there was uh, various restrictions being put in place, many corporations have gone into uh, business continuity mode, and you would see also re that would lead to a certain reduction in size of delegations in terms of the size of meetings being held. And I think that's going to be a norm until such a time where there there is a all clear signal given or experienced by all the key markets. So I think that's that's going to be uh, the order of the day. Um, again, it, it remains to be seen when the, the situation comes back to normal. It is indeed very uh, heartening to note that some early green shoots are emerging in China. Um, I'm not sure what the situation would be like here in Singapore and Southeast Asia. I think the concern is there could be a resurgence uh, because this virus, what we have seen over the past three months, it's coming down in waves. 
And if you look at taking a cue from EU as well as the UK and the US, particularly the US, when the entry points from the eastern and western seaboard are now getting infected and they're rolling into to, to, to the US, um, we, we really don't know how, what else is going to happen, plus with the rise of imported cases. And we've seen that being practiced in China, where imported cases are being really taken very seriously. And, I, and we certainly hope that that will be the case for many economies here in Southeast Asia. Um, for us, our greatest concern in Singapore and perhaps in Southeast Asia is what is the situation like in Indonesia. Um, that's something where day by day we see rising cases and Indonesia is a major market for shows here in Asia Pacific. And if for whatever reason uh, it is not being being um, kept uh, under check, uh, we really do not know what sort of travel restrictions and advisories will be imposed for this key market uh, that will serve our exhibitions and our trade events. So um, I think that's all I can share at this point in time. I am happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thanks, Aloysius. Uh, I, I want to ask you one of the same ones that I just asked Michael Duck, uh, which is uh, Singapore's uh, government support for the industry. There, I, I just saw an announcement that um, I think it was for the tourism sector overall. Singapore government just announced some measures. Uh, are there specific measures for exhibitions or just for, for the mice sector specifically in that new announcement? Right. So um, yesterday, the government announced uh, a Singapore dollars, 55 billion in terms of um, what we call the resilience package. Uh, it's to support enterprises and workers. Um, it covers, it's quite a broad base uh, package uh, and with targeted measures being uh, looked at for the aviation as well as the tourism industries uh, of which uh, MICE is under the tourism side. Uh, so this broadly comes in the form of uh, which support or which credit support, job support scheme, whereby close to 25% of workers' salaries are going to be borne by the government uh, with a cap of about 4,600 uh, Singapore dollars. So that's about 3,005, 3,008 US dollars. Uh, and then it's 25% of that amount. So that's going to be very helpful um, for the uh, tourism and for the mice uh, industry, that, that support goes all the way up to 75%. So it's really very targeted. Uh, there is a big sort of lifeline that has been put in place for the airline industry. Um, I think Michael Duck mentioned about that, whereby airlines here, I mean, for the first time, we are seeing at least 100 over planes on Singapore Airlines being uh, docked at the tarmac uh, in Changi Airport. They have gone into corporate action, and I think there's, there is also a, a new issuance of shares coming out in order to support uh, Singapore Airlines. And I think that's, that's one thing we have to be quite mindful of, um, the aviation sector. I'm not sure how many airlines will survive, um, and that will also be an impact on the visitorship uh, to our shows. So, but, and that's something we, we need to see how these will, will, will pan out. Certainly there'll be consolidation. I think that's why where national carriers are concerned, I'm sure many, many governments will do their level best to make sure they keep them pumping. Um, the other expect got to do with enterprises. So this has to do with uh, corporate income tax that's payable in the preceding year, that's been deferred. Um, there's also a range of support given to what we call the gig workers, the freelancers, um, and that's uh, to a tune of about um, 800 US dollars thereabouts per month. So that can help them and all this will tie them through for, and all these schemes will be for the next six months to nine months. Um, the government is very, um, I would say, prepared if they need to be a second boost to support, uh, that's possibly going to come. And I think the next month uh, is going to be crucial in order to get a sense as to how the different corners of the world are managing or containing uh, this, this crisis. So that's that's far as the latest uh, round of measures that have come up to help keep um, the enterprises and workers at least uh, afloat. 
Uh, thanks, Aloysius. One more question from me. Before, we'll come back to you at the end, but because um, I see uh, Chris McEwen and some others have some questions for you in the chat, but we'll come back to that. Uh, when I was in Singapore in mid-March, I mean, it, uh, so much has already changed just in uh, 10 days, but I met with you and Bibiana from SunTech and with uh, MBS, and you were all, all of you were already getting uh, postponements as things were kicking off in Europe and the US. You were getting requests for postponement into the summer, which was new from just a week before. Do you have any sense from your clients? Is there any confidence into say August and September now? Or can you sort of share where your client's uh, view of things are? Uh well, we've just had another round of postponements by a couple of organizers. Um, yeah. I think everybody is uncertain when this will kick in. So we are seeing the schedule of shows, in, particularly in August, September, holding there. Uh, but plan Bs are already being worked on very uh, aggressively. So I think um, to be on a conservative basis, um, people are looking at probably October, November. And I think the, this whole thing about China New Year holidays, summer holidays, you can throw that out of the window. <laughs> I think everybody wants to, wants to have the shows quickly so that we can get back to business ASAP. But uh, it remains to be seen, uh, as I said, how, when that will, 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 will take place in the, the, the shows. But it's going to be very wise for all of us to make sure that we've got a plan B. Uh, and not, okay. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. I, I was going to say, I, I've got one more question that came in, just came in and is a good one. With all of these events trying to be squeezed now into looks like the fourth quarter, uh, are there going to, the profile protections, are they still going to be in place or with all the events so squeezed together, are exceptions going to be made? H how is that going to work from an operational level? I think uh, on a, um, what, what is the guiding I would say principle here it's inventory um, and for organizers I think it is it's in, important for them to make the assessment as to whether or not um, where would the competing shows be like um, and it's not just in Singapore but also whether the circuit in Southeast Asia North Asia how does it all pan out so perhaps there could be uh, uh, somewhat of a global reset in terms of the circuit of events. So I think we need to perhaps bear that in mind. Um, mm -hmm. So what one, one thing we are looking at is there will definitely be a bunching up of events and the impact and the pressure it will, it will create, the stress it will create on the system as well as this whole long tail of, ser of service providers that need to support it. Um, I think we also have to bear in mind we do not know how many people, how many enterprises will survive if this goes on by three, four or five months. I mean, if we look at the cash flow, SMEs particularly, if you can have two, three months of cash flow, that'd be great. But I think it's already two, three months and without any business, even with lifelines thrown in, uh, can you still survive? So I think that something remains to be seen and we have to be, to be really prepared to think really hard and innovative uh, when, the, when the postponed shows uh, come into action in full force. That's, that's great, thanks. Uh, I've got some more other good questions and I'm gonna be a bit loose with the timing, looser than I normally am because this is really useful and helpful to everyone. So uh, what we'll do now is Aloysius, I'll ask you to put your mic back, mic back on mute. Uh, and then I'll call on Anbu. Are you there, Anbu? No. Hi, Mark. Hi, everyone. Hi, Hi Anbu. Before, before you get started, uh, I'll just do two shout outs uh, to separate things. One, I want to remind everybody we've got the UFI um, coronavirus resources page, which I already posted in the chat, and I'll repost in a minute, or maybe one of the UFI team on the call now can post it. And secondly, uh, uh, there's quite a few questions about, you know, what are things going to look like on the other side of this? What about the resilience of events? We have research we're doing with Explory uh, on this, and you can get involved with that. Sophie, I know you're on the call. I saw you post that. Can you post it again? All right, Ambu, uh, I will hand over to you to give us the update from Bangalore on India. And uh, yeah, welcome to our incoming UFI president. Thanks, Mark. Thanks very much. And uh, as you all said, uh, unprecedented time. 
uh, completely a different level of challenge than all markets. And India also, we, we face the same. Um, till January or till beginning of February, uh, though uh, the issue had been talked about in several quarters, it was not considered uh, as a real big issue um, in India, in, in, in uh, many, uh, I would say, cities and, uh, you know, uh, uh, geographical areas as well. To put this in perspective, when China, Hong Kong, and, um, you know, Singapore are being to sick bed, they're coming out, they come out, they're recuperating, but India is just walking into the hospital. Okay, I would just put it like that. Um, it was mid-February, 15th February, we had few cases, uh, around three or so. So it was gradually picking up. Uh, it took more than a month till 20th of March, we had about 200 cases. But then as we have seen, the trend is same. As we've seen all of our countries, it was rapidly expanding. The last six, seven days is become fourfold. Okay, it's more than 750 in terms of number today. And we have seen the number of deaths increasing as well. Uh, though the numbers are not are really big, uh, the way we have seen in some of the other markets, countries, but uh, the trend is certainly the same and is very, very alarming. So government got into this um, in a very strong way. Uh, the central government as well as all state governments. Okay, we are seeing this uh, first time in a very, very coordinated manner uh, led by the prime minister himself. So the prime minister addressed the nation the last few days twice. He called us um, public curfew on last Sunday. So the PM called for everyone to support and just be inside the homes. Okay. I would say that everyone responded, almost everyone. But then what followed was dramatic. Immediately after that, from 24th onwards, it's nationwide lockdown. Okay. So uh, the entire country, industry, shopping, everything has been locked down. So the basic idea here is in terms of strategic action, what the government is trying to do is, uh, uh, of course, learning from you know, other countries, the way it happened, uh, flattening the curve. So if the numbers become really big, it becomes a different challenge for India because of the population number. We're dealing with 1.3 uh, you know, billion people. Uh, so the idea is to uh, not to allow the peak to happen. So uh, isolation as well as uh, social distancing uh, is um, uh, taken to people in a dramatic manner by uh, all you know, quarters, you know, state governments, almost the entire government machinery has been put into this, as well as all other major associations. I'm saying almost all key associations are working with the government. You know, Alertius mentioned about this quite well, uh, but uh, the government has got into this in a big way, which is uh, necessary at this stage. We simply can't allow this to become a big problem and then try and control it. So currently, India is in what we call a stage two. I think in some areas, stage two to stage three, but then uh, we need to control it uh, at uh, stage two and not really allow this problem to become a big issue as part of stage three. That's the uh, whole strategy for the nation. Now, um, when we look at our own experience in Bangalore, we had the machine tool show in January. We didn't have uh, any major impact, uh, fortunately. We had all the, uh, 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 you know, uh, all participants, both 50% of them came from uh, overseas, 50% of them came from Indian, you know, different areas of India. So we had uh, the full show. We had two major shows in February, one on uh, stonewalking, uh, one on, uh, um, you know, uh, woodworking machinery. We had some damage, these all guest shows, 
but uh, we had uh, uh, some reduction, you can say maybe about 10%, but the show happened. But then after, after February, March, everything has been canceled or postponed. I don't see till July any show happening in our you know, premises. And I see the same trend in other uh, you know, places as well in India, Bombay, Delhi, Hyderabad. So the earliest thing in terms of comeback could be end of September uh, or October. Q1 is for India is April, May, June is first quarter of financial year. Q1 is a washout for the industry. And uh, Q2, most part, would be impacted in a, in a big way. Uh, end of Q2, you might see some small shows. Any major ones will happen only after that. Okay, September 2nd of onwards, October onwards, things you know, would come back. It again depends on how fast we recovered from this. Okay, we are in uh, March end. If we can manage to have the issue in control, in April, okay, or May, mid of May, I think we would see uh, a, a faster uh, recovery. If the, if the issue becomes, uh, uh, you know, prolonged, then the comeback also will be uh, uh, slower. The current lockdown is for a three-week period till mid of 15th of April, but I think it might continue for another couple of weeks at least. So that's the uh, thing that you see uh, on the ground. But um, one consolation uh, uh, is um, this is a lean period in India, by and large, for all exhibition companies and also our, all venues. You know, uh, the Q1 is summer period. You don't see too many shows or too many big shows happening. And same thing with Q2 as well, at least for two thirds of the Q2 part. So most major shows happen in Q3 and Q4. So that way, I think I would say 25% uh, of the trade fair industry uh, I can say, to put this in perspective, is impacted. Uh, if I take my own venue, I think till, if I take till uh, July or part of August, it's about 20%. Okay. If many of the shows come back, I think uh, they would look at a bit of a recovery uh, as well. But important thing is a point what has been touched already. Okay. How many of the shows that are coming back will come back in 100% you know, uh, in terms of size? not very likely. And also other shows that are going to happen also make it impacted. There will be erosion. So it's very difficult to say at this stage because we are at the beginning of a yes curve, perhaps and, after and, and a boom. month or two. Yes. Yeah, so I'm just going to interrupt j just for a second. It's six o'clock. This was when we were going to end. I'm going to tell everybody that we're going to go on for another 15 minutes. We'll wrap up that. Uh, oh, yeah. It's, it's, Everyone's in a different time zone. We'll go on for about another 15 minutes, but if you have to leave now, thanks very much for joining. All right, back to you, Anbu. Okay, thanks, thanks. Thanks, Mark. So, um, um, I think we will, we will get a slightly clearer position, maybe in another month or uh, you know, you know, two months at this stage is very early to say what kind of damage we will see, either for the exhibition industry and also for the economy. Uh, Coming back to, uh, again, the, the uh, okay, one more point I want to say, you know, I, I can, uh, this is a very uh, um, a positive thing. I've seen in the social media as well as in personal comments everywhere, particularly uh, the leaders from the exhibition industry, trying to be positive in the face of uh, such a, you know, intense enemy. Okay, people are uh, really trying to be innovative uh, in terms of being, uh, uh, you know, uh, touch with customer, also uh, practicing business continuity processes. And I see a lot of things happening there and a lot of positive sentiments coming here. But this is absolutely different compared to what really happens in terms of uh, business damage. But then this would definitely help in terms of bringing back these sentiments a little later, you know, when you come back in the uh, end of Q2 or maybe in Q3. Uh, that's a good thing I, I want to you know, notice. Um, Government, as I, as I said, has been doing a lot, uh, you know, uh, pretty early. Um, I think they have announced uh, an economic uh, stimulus package, uh, especially look at the uh, bottom of the pyramid peoples, so that they don't, uh, you know, 
uh, go completely, uh, you know, without any support at all. Uh, so almost uh, to the tune of 23 billion US dollars uh, package has been announced, but we are at the beginning of, uh, you know, the government initiatives. And I think uh, already, I think my other fellow speakers mentioned about uh, liquidity. I see that again becoming a big issue when we, uh, you know, come back. And uh, just this morning, uh, but, you know, uh, the Reserve Bank of India uh, brought in a lot of announcements. One is to try and see how uh, liquidity support of almost 50 billion US dollars, uh, you know, come into position. So you, you, and also the interest rate has been slashed to a reasonable extent. Uh, so you find many of this, uh, you know, things are already, you know, happening in place. But the the uh, 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 the real damage uh, we will be able to assess perhaps, uh, you know, a, a month or two from now. But my take at this stage is Q1, Q2 uh, will be a Q1 is gone, gone completely. Q2, uh, most part of Q2 would be impacted. A reasonable, you know, comeback is going to be one day around September or perhaps October onwards. And then do you, uh, do you imagine uh, the government will come out with direct measures for the exhibition industry? At this stage, they're looking at, uh, you know, it's very clear. Uh, they're looking at uh, safety first. Okay, I think uh, whatever the government is trying to do, it's all on that, how to keep people safe. But the economic, you know, package, whatever they've initiated, it's at the overall industry level. They're not looked at sectoral, but then sectoral things may follow uh, or you know, just after this. We need to wait and see. But exhibition industry is quite possible. Uh, mm -hmm. But then we are yet to see the, you know, uh, uh, you know, the initiatives on that. It's quite possible. It may, came, it may come a little uh, later. Okay. And what about uh, Pragati Maidan? Was, uh, the, the work on that was supposed to finish mid-year this year, right? Uh, do you know whether that's been affected or what the schedule is for the completion of that work? Everything has been affected, Mark. I think, you know, you can, you can take all infrastructure work, will get, uh, uh, push back by at least about uh, three to four months. Okay, so it's 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 not uh, the 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 Q1 alone that we are talking about here. When we come back, the, the recovery period also will take some time. Uh, but uh, the one positive thing is when government uh, you know gets into the action, infrastructure is one of the important things they would look at uh, for stimulating economy, and also the public procurement, that's another thing they would look at. And there are already, you know, big level talks, both from the industry associations as well as, well as government uh, on, uh, you know, using these two, you know, mechanisms uh, to, 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 as a stimulus. Okay, so we'll have to wait and see, but then certainly there will be an impact. You can, a reasonable period would be three to four months. Great, okay. Thanks, Anbu. Uh, if you can go back on mute for a minute, uh, I've got a couple questions that I've gathered here that uh, I'll, I'll ask to the speakers. So I guess for Michael Duck, uh, Michael, this one's come in so many times, uh, I stopped writing it down. Uh, is overall, is the virus outbreak going to drive uh, virtual events ahead? Are we going to see a surge in those? as a, a viable way of generating revenue on the other side of this? Well, certainly I think it's given the opportunity for uh, the software industry to look at this again. Uh, as uh, Informer and previously as UBM, we actually went into virtual events and we had our own studios in Chicago for, but this is going back 10 years or so. It's almost like talking about uh, the speed of 64K you know, today the broadband speeds are very, very different. Uh, software is very different. And uh, there are some interesting uh, software positions out there. Uh, and no doubt, um, some people are looking at <laughs> how to make that work. And uh, uh, I think it can be, and it's something alongside uh, a show. Uh, but for those shows who are not taking place for one or who knows, two years, it's a viable alternative. Great, thank you. And uh, Michael Kruper, I wanted to ask you the same question that I put to Aloysius about uh, theme protection. Once you get SNEAC up and running again and you've got a squeeze of a lot of events that are trying to get into a smaller space, how are you gonna manage that? 
Well, it's a it's a big puzzle. It has been a big puzzle before already. Who who in this room uh, knows Sneak that you know that we are sometimes struggling with this topic. Uh, we already had discussions for the second half where there might be certain conflicts. So far, when that happened, and again, it's not confirmed because things are changing almost daily, when, that, when there might be potential, let's say, conflict due to change of slots, so far, the two organizers concerned, they, or we could arrange, they talk to each other and could have accepted such slot. But already in four out of five cases, these slots meanwhile already have been reshuffled. So um, the answer is it might be uncertain at this point of view. And I see it from a venue's point of view, of course, with a clear view, trying to protect the organizers as much as possible, that all of us in a year where it's really an emergency situation for all of us, we might be rather than social distancing for the common mindset, be a bit closer together. But maybe just for that year. But again, we don't know when we can restart. Again, hope that Diane is a light at the end of the tunnel. But our view is as much as possible, try to protect, but ask for understanding from the organizers if such situation may occur. Thank, thanks, Michael. Uh, okay, I'm gonna wrap this up in just a minute. Uh, I promised Kelly from TSEB, she wants to give a one minute update from Bangkok. Kelly, are you there? Hi, hi, Mark. Hi, hi Mark. And hi, hi. Chapa as well. Okay, Kelly, fire away. Hi, thank you, Mark, and hello, everyone. Um, for a situation update of Thailand exhibition industry, so far, there's a zero cancellations of exhibition in Thailand. And during the situation back in February, we have two shows organized uh, uh, during the situation and the performance of that two shows, unbelievable. They have increasing in number of visitors, but now the, the venue close, all the venue close, and we expect to have uh, first shows scheduled to be running in June. So what we do, the, the government that launch several relief measures uh, related with, with tax for TSEP ourselves, what we do to react with the situation, we set up COVID-19 center in order to share situation update to all the key stakeholders. And we also join force call for collaboration with other governments like custom to facilitate all the postponed shows to extend the temporary tax of exhibit of postponed shows. And we also launch immediately Thailand extra exhibition in order to uh, protect call shows with, uh, to support them to organize the show during the situation. And as of now, we are working on recovery plan. And hopefully the big business will be bowed back in Thailand from July onwards by the time we, we plan to launch more attractive campaign for organizer, new organizer who would like to launch shows in Thailand as a platform to explore to ASEAN and also to attract more exhibitors and more visitors in ASEAN to visit in Thai trade shows. Great, thank you, Kelly, that, that's great. Uh, we could keep going and going, but uh, we, we promised we'd wrap up by quarter past the hour. So I'm gonna do that now. Uh, I wanna thank everybody for being on the call. I, I didn't look down at the high number of participants, but I think we got up over 350 at one point. Uh, wanna thank our diamond sponsors who are on the call. So Chapa and Kelly were there, Joanne from Freeman and Michael Michael from, uh, from Cutter. Thanks to everybody for dialing in. It was a bit of an experiment. I, I hope it worked for you. I hope you were able to learn something about what's happening on the ground here. We'll be back with more of these in the future. You can visit the UFI webpage for uh, listings. We have regional ones going as well. We've already done one for Latin America and for Europe. Nick and Anna Maria have done theirs and Najee's gonna do one for the Middle East. So uh, we'll make sure we update you guys on those as they get scheduled. The resource page, I really encourage you, it's in the chat there somewhere, someone will post it again. I encourage you guys to go have a look there and to join the Explory UFI um, 
uh, resilience study. All right, everybody, thanks very much. This was really helpful. Have a good weekend, and we'll see you back here sometime soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.